Okay.
Hello everyone, we will start as a panel. I'll first give the floor to Divina uh, from MEGS, which will present uh, the panel and how we will work today. Thank you. Thank you, Lucien. Thank you uh, all uh, to be uh, here uh, at the second day of IGF, rather intense. Uh, I'm particularly happy to welcome uh, uh, my uh, young students from uh, Sorbonne Nouvelle who are present here uh, and who are having the experience of participating in a, in a global event uh, like this. I think uh, like all of you, we, we want young people to be uh, uh, present and to uh, uh, benefit also from our exchanges. Um, I also want to thank uh, the panel for um, being here, some of you coming um, from uh, a, long, uh, a long way. Um, we'll go a bit more. Do you have an echo like me? Uh, is there an echo in the room? No, it's okay. Um, I, also, I also wanted to, uh, to thank the panel because they've also come from different parts of the world um, uh, and we'll go uh, to each of them at a time. I just wanted to make sure we uh, uh, know how it's going to work and the panel is going to be about given about, given about five minutes to present their perspective on this idea of information disorders and uh, the kind of solutions they are propounding um, and uh, then there'll be uh, an exchange with a room with them uh, and then there'll be a second time where the room people in the room can also participate about the uh, solutions uh, the perspectives that they have so that we we have really a two-way dialogue and we can uh, figure together uh, the way uh, the way forward and that will be another uh, good um, 40 minutes so the important thing for us is uh, to interact as much as we can on, on this uh, on this issue um, the issue is also to have online participation and uh, Francesca Muziani, who is over there, will be uh, overseeing this and will uh, also signal to us um, some uh, questions that can um, be coming from, uh, from abroad. Um, and um, to go about the theme of this um, session, uh, when we started proposing it with uh, Lucien uh, uh, Castex, uh, Francesca Musiani, Isoc, Isoc in general, and Internet uh, uh, Society, um, information disorder was uh, really big and everybody was becoming uh, aware of them, be it radicalization, be it disinformation. But I think um, we, we are a little bit further away in this conversation, in this discussion. We, we have taken stock, though some of our panelists will also help us and take stock. And so I think we would all like to push the conversation more towards solutions. How do we uh, find solutions? What kind of solutions can come from the public sector, from the private sector, from civil society, from youth? And uh, I think this is, I think, the spirit in which we, we devised uh, this, um, this session. Uh, and this is what we would like to take away and uh, we will be reporting on this, and so you'll have access to, to the report. Pascal Garraud and Joseph Baudreau uh, over there are also doing the, the reporting. Okay? So, Lucien, you want to start? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Divina. I will quickly present our, our panelists. Um, first, Emmanuel Adjevi from the Organisation Française de la Francophonie. Uh, Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie, sorry. Um, I'll correct that on the website also. <laughs> uh, also, we have Denis Tessu uh, from the Agence France Presse. We have Paola Forteza from the French Parliament. And uh, Hamed Murat Kilic from the Council of Europe. And uh, Jean-Baptiste Piacentino from Quant. And finally, uh, Rasmus Nielsen from the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford. I will want to give the floor uh, first to him, to Rasmus. Thank you. Thanks very much uh, for the invitation to join this panel. Um, I think the premise of these conversations here at IGF uh, as elsewhere is that we all recognize that this information represents a wide variety of different problems. Uh, that cannot be usefully collapsed into a single problem. Um, 
We also, I think, all recognize that these different problems are animated by a wide variety of different actors and they operate in different contexts and any response has to recognize both the diversity of the problems, there is a difference between foreign states interfering in elections or domestic politicians propagating disinformation or bottom-up misinformation that is spread in good faith by individual citizens but that may still be harmful. Um, and again, the context uh, matter and we have to tailor our responses to that. I think we also increasingly recognize, as we discuss this around the world, that um, the, the part of the difficulty we have in responding effectively is that many uh, problems of disinformation are enabled by technologies that are also used for entirely legitimate purposes, ranging from the completely mundane, where we simply entertain ourselves or coordinate everyday life or purchase things and the like, to things that many of us in this room might think of as progressive. Uh, the same technologies that have enabled propaganda and disinformation and hate speech have also enabled something like Me Too, for example, to flourish in many different countries around the world in ways that demonstrably was not the case before digital media. So how can we respond uh, to the variety of different disinformation problems in a way that minimize harm without depredating gains and future potential? Um, how can we respond in ways that take these problems seriously but also try to understand the scale and scope of them and bring evidence to the discussion that is sometimes dominated by self-interested voices, whether from private companies uh, or other sites, and are sometimes used to undercut people's in confidence in independent institutions that are trying to hold, for example, politicians to account or enable free communication among citizens in ways that are sometimes uncomfortable for political elites. I think it's very important that we do not confuse a crisis for the political establishment with a crisis for democracy necessarily. These are not necessarily the same things. So in this context, my personal uh, suggestion would be that we start from uh, the idea of fundamental rights, that we recognize uh, that many problems of disinformation fundamentally do not, uh, uh, are not primarily around a distinction between truth and falsehood, or even between things that in any way are simply harmful or not harmful, but are deeply ambiguous because they reflect deep differences of opinion in our societies and the fact that we live in irreducibly diverse societies where people have different views of what the good life looks like and will often disagree strongly about how to live those lives and how to live those lives together. So my personal suggestion would be to think about how we empower open societies and renew the robust institutions that enable citizens to make good use of that liberty. I think that's about avoiding uh, rushing into direct content regulation first of all, I think that's about addressing other issues that are important but not necessarily about disinformation separately. These issues would include privacy, competition and national security that should not be collapsed into disinformation in my, from my point of view. I think secondly we need to focus on the role of public authorities not primarily in terms of directly intervening in content regulation which I think we have many reasons to be skeptical of uh, if we want to enable people to be free and have robust exchanges of views but to orchestrate and incentivize collaborative, multi-stakeholder approaches, what I've called a soft power approach that's very different from a hard power approach that directly intervenes and forces different entities to do specific things, but instead uh, tries to support independent media, civil society, media and information literacy efforts, researchers and others as they are trying to equip citizens to navigate an evolving information environment. And I think finally, um, thirdly, we need to monitor progress. Um, I'm personally a big believer in the idea of multi-stakeholder collaborative responses based on soft power rather than direct intervention, which I think we have many reasons to believe risk being more harmful than the disease they're uh, uh, purported to address, as we think Freedom House and others have warned. Uh, but of course, self-regulation and multi-stakeholder approaches should not be an excuse for inaction or the dragging of feet. And we need to monitor progress through independent assessments, greater access to data, and investment in research by public authorities, but also in independent researchers and third parties that can independently assess research. No one, neither states nor private companies, should be allowed to mark their own homework. So we would never regulate our physical infrastructure without access to serious and rigorous assessments of uh, what we're trying to do. So that leads to bridge collapses, for example, as we've seen in Europe. And it shocks me that we're sometimes considering doing the same for the infrastructure of free expression. I think we should be as serious about our assessment of the freedom, uh, ex uh, the infrastructure of free expression as we are for any other kind of infrastructure. And I hope we can jointly move towards such an assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Rasmus, um, for uh, putting forward, uh, of course, the, the role of research and uh, uh, giving us caution about how to, how to use it and the, the skeptical 
approach we should have to other kinds of reactions. As a result, I think I'm going to ask uh, Paola Forteza to, to take over because Rasmus sent you a challenge, right? He said he's skeptical about the role of public authorities and you've had to deal with this. And so could you speak to us about what, what information disorders do to politicians and how some of the solutions that you have looked uh, and yourself been uh, active into uh, could come up as uh, uh, possibilities to, to consider worldwide? Um, yes, so, so information disorder are uh, really um, uh, having a great impact in our democracies. Uh, and uh, we try to uh, touch on this uh, issue uh, through the fake news law uh, that France uh, put in place. Uh, we had a lot of debates around this law, uh, which uh, demonstrates how delicate this issue is and, and how much uh, a lot of, of um, uh, rights that are fundamental uh, are uh, in stake when we're uh, talking about these issues. We're talking about freedom of speech, we're talking about access to information, we're talking about defamation, we're talking about uh, the right to have loyal elections. Uh, so this is a very delicate uh, issue. Uh, what we tried to do in France uh, was to choose was a choice not to take uh, the German uh, road, uh, which uh, gives the responsibility uh, to um, companies to take down uh, content uh, when they think uh, it's uh, a fake news or it's uh, an, an illegal content or a defa defamatory content. Uh, this is very um, this, this can be uh, very tricky in terms of freedom of speech because uh, when you have uh, very important fines, um, these companies uh, take down more content than they should uh, because they don't want uh, to, to be uh, fined. So um, what we tried to do in France was uh, to uh, put a, a judge in the picture and we tried really to circumscribe uh, this, uh, this fake news issue in uh, the um, in the moment of elections um, and there was a lot of, of debate around uh, is a judge uh, able to define what is the truth, uh, uh, is uh, the truth contextual, is the truth cultural, uh, are we uh, creating a minister of truth uh, like uh, in the uh, 1984 uh, book that we uh, all want to, uh, that, that scares us all. Um, so we tried to find, find this balance and, and we did a job to circumscribe uh, this dispositive the most. And uh, we did also a lot of advances in terms of transparency and this was, I think, the best part of the law because uh, we asked transparency around uh, sponsored contents on social media. And we worked a lot also on transparency of uh, recommendation algorithms. Uh, and we tried to do this without um, going against uh, the, the secrets of um, affairs, uh, because as we know, we can't ask a company to deliver uh, their, uh, their algorithm or their source code uh, uh, on a mandatory basis. Uh, but uh, we can ask them to uh, give um, statistics about the outputs of these uh, algorithms uh, which can uh, help uh, civil society researchers uh, to understand what are the biases of these algorithms and if there is some content uh, that is more diffused than others. Um, so that's what we were working on uh, at the French level. But uh, this is not enough. Uh, why is it not enough? Because uh, these issues are evolving uh, very quickly uh, on a daily basis. Uh, legislation needs to, to be updated uh, very quickly. That's why I, I, was, uh, I proposed to have uh, a, a sunset clause for this law. Um, I wasn't heard, by, but I think this is one of the keys of this kind of adaptative regulation that we're trying to put in place uh, where we can uh, update uh, the, the legal framework at the same speed as technological change. And uh, one example of, of why this is, isn't enough is, for instance, what happened in Brazil uh, for the last election. Uh, so um, an election that 
uh, for me, uh, moved me uh, person on, a, on a personal basis because I, I represent French people from Latin America and uh, um, I think uh, it's, uh, it's dangerous what happened. Uh, during this election we had uh, a very coordinated um, campaign of fake news uh, that was led by uh, Bolsonaro. Uh, he uh, paid up to $3 million to uh, companies to uh, send massive um, messaging through, uh, uh, through WhatsApp, for instance. And uh, this is very tricky in terms of what kind of fake news we're used to, because it's uh, private messaging. So uh, it's encrypted. Um, encrypted messages, we can't uh, recognize or identify that this fake news is being diffused. And uh, well, th this is not new because we always had these spam campaigns online through mailing, for instance, uh, that was very present, for instance, in 2015 for the election uh, of the, the constitution for, for Europe. Um, but in, uh, in Brazil, uh, this took place also because uh, they don't have the kind of uh, protections that we're trying to put in place in Europe. Uh, with the GDPR, uh, we have this, this protection of, of personal data which allows that uh, we don't have these uh, huge mailings that are uh, on sale uh, and that can be acquired very easily like it was the case in Brazil. And we have this neutrality um, politics that makes that uh, in Brazil we can have for instance, zero rating uh, issues that make that some uh, platforms or, or some um, messaging applications uh, get like consolidate the majority of the users. In Brazil, we have 96% uh, of users that uh, own a smartphone that are on WhatsApp. So it's very easy uh, to uh, diffuse uh, messages and. Um, and it's very quickly to do that. Uh, some of the messages that were uh, conveyed, for instance, was that, um, that the PT, PT uh, the, um, uh, the candidate for the left, sorry, uh, was uh, going to put in place a gay kit in uh, schools to uh, teach how to be gay to children. So this was nonsense. And uh, there were uh, faking pictures uh, uh, of these uh, left-wing candidates uh, next to Fidel Castro, so to uh, show at what point they were uh, extremist and, uh, and, uh, and polarized. And all these issues diffused very, very quickly uh, thanks to this uh, lack of regulation uh, in Brazil. But this is, is a new way of, of, of fake news and is uh, asking a lot of questions on, on how we can uh, regulate this effect effectively. So, um, I mean, a couple of months uh, later, uh, uh, the vote of, of this uh, law, uh, the fake, this fake new law in France, we're already seeing new ways uh, for fake news to spread. So, uh, I encourage all of us to really think on how we can have the most flexible and adaptive regulation uh, when we're talking uh, of these issues. And of course, uh, uh, work on uh, other kinds of, of um, solutions based on, on education, on fact checking, but I'm sure uh, the other panelists will uh, talk about that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Paola. Indeed, uh, transparency uh, is quite important in understanding bias uh, and uh, indeed, indeed is a key in fighting fake news and information disorder. I, I would like to give the floor to, to Denis Tessou from the Agence France Presse to, to tell us about more uh, about the challenges uh, and the solution that you are working on. Thank you, and thanks for the kind invitation to talk in, into this panel. Uh, I've been working in the last three years uh, on, uh, in, on in, uh, a European uh, Horizon 2020 project called INVID uh, for InVideo Veritas, which is a project about verification of videos on social networks. And obviously, since uh, the end of 2016, we have been tackling 
and debunking a lot of uh, uh, so-called fake news. We prefer to use the word, uh, the word disinformation. And more and more what we see is that images are more and more important in terms of uh, disinformation and uh, information disorders. Uh, especially because images trigger more emotional reactions from the audience and they are more and more shared either uh, on video, either smartphone videos, either decontextualized videos coming from the past and just put back on social networks to illustrate some kind of new breaking news event. And especially during elections, we also have a lot of uh, fake content coming, uh, coming out, but not only about elections, also what we have demonstrated uh, during the INVIT project is that you have some xenophobic campaign, uh, especially uh, against migrants, uh, where, which are circulating in different countries around, especially around Europe, but even around the world, by using the same kind of videos in different contexts in each country. And the only similarity is the similarity of the image. And even if those those fake news, in fact, are debunked in one country, they still reappear a few days after in another country. And so there is a, a persistence of fake news. Uh, Umberto Eco, uh, in a book called Serendipities, wrote a chapter uh, talking about the force of falsity. And we, have, we are facing this force of falsity. We have fake news which are coming back in the loop, months after months, the same kind of pictures, the same kind of, especially, uh, xenophobic or racist campaigns are coming back on social networks, on different uh, private social networks like WhatsApp, as was just said at, at the moment, uh, but it can be of course Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and others. And so this is, uh, this is uh, one of the problem and that's why in Invit we provided some tools to journalists, to uh, human rights defenders, to fact checkers to be able to debunk rapidly those fake news because if we want to avoid the virality of those uh, disinformation and uh, information troubles, we need to debunk it very quickly. And so to, to inform the network that this is not appropriate, that this kind of content is misleading, and then we may sometimes, I mean, most of the time we can s stop the spreading of this content and have less effect in terms of uh, swindling the, uh, the, the voters and misleading uh, uh, citizens. So that's, uh, I would insist on, on that uh, notion of, uh, of images because that's uh, really important. That's becoming more and more important because as you may know, uh, we, are come, uh, we are seeing, foreseeing some kind of new technologies which are still separated, but we have face-to-face -face technologies where anybody can imitate the face of any famous person. We have uh, vocal uh, voice synthesization where some software programs are claiming that they can learn the voice of anybody in, with 20 minutes of discourse. And if you combine all those technologies plus uh, images created by artificial intelligence, you can create almost the perfect fake. That means somebody making anybody talk about anything. And this is dangerous, obviously, and that's especially dangerous because from the journalistic point of view, uh, we miss the source. There's a dilution of sources on the internet. When you're asking young people where did they get their news, they always tell you most of the time on Instagram, on Facebook, or maybe on Twitter, but they never catch the, new, the source of the news. That means the, the accuracy of what they are reading. And even it seems that they do not bother about that. So in that address, at this respect, I would say that media information literacy is key to make people understand that the sources are extremely important, especially today when the information is spreading all over the networks. You need to, to, to think about the source and to identify the source, because especially in a world where we are going to, be, to face this kind of defect, it will be very important to know where do they come from, just not to believe any kind of oaxes or misinformation. Thank you, Denis, for this perfect fake scenario <laughs> that we have to take into account in our discussion. Um, you talked about, um, from a perspective of uh, the profession, one of the stakeholders, uh, but there is also uh, the pure players in the private sector who are stakeholders, and that's why we would like to hear the perspective of Quant, which is one of the uh, 
uh, European search engines um, that may present some alternatives to the GAFAM. So, please, Jean-Baptiste Jean Piacentino. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I, I, wouldn't, I, I'm hate what, I hate what I'm going to say here, but I have bad news for all of us. Fake news are not going to disappear. I mean, and as a matter of fact, they've always been here. You know, since the beginning, since the beginning of times, you always had extremist people and people who were disliking each other and uh, spreading news that were absolutely wrong. So, the difference that we are experiencing in this uh, in these days is obviously the magnifying lenses that the information platforms are. Um, providing and dare I say the monopolies uh, that they uh, represent uh, in the world uh, today you know I may uh, Divina mentioned the GAFA but you know there are uh, other uh, information monopoly uh, distribution the content source the in uh, monopoly um, around there obviously and we mentioned a few of them here so um, one possibility one option to fight fake news is to uh, address the problem of monopolies and uh, dominance of information platforms um, in the search engine space which you know is uh, where quant is uh, playing uh, we obviously facing there are say giants I mean they're probably not even the the right word for this you know huge companies that uh, rule most of the information that we experience every day uh, but nevertheless you know we took the challenge and uh, tried to develop a search engine that uh, brings forward a certain number of values that uh, encourage transparency and trust and those are privacy respect um, this is absolutely key to understanding that uh, uh, there may be different perspective in presenting data and presenting information when you consider that the search engine you are trusting um, is actually not personalizing or over personalizing the data you are uh, getting from this platform um, so personalization is one key element of the combat against fake news um, quant does not uh, collect any personal information whatsoever we don't care about who you are where you where you are from uh, what your interests are you know all we care about is providing information uh, based on your request and that is available on the web so once we have done that we don't we absolutely want to forget everything that you have done with us and not even before because we don't know but you know during this during, during this request and that gives us a position where uh, users can trust that the data they are experiences are the same for everyone since there is no personalization so I want to put the emphasis on the fact that over personalization is um, a, a, a drama um, in, in, in today's um, uh, digital world uh, when it comes to over personalization and there's um, there are alternatives which are uh, basically about favorizing the emergence of competition in uh, the space where there are observed monopolies I think the European Union has taken uh, you know some uh, some uh, movement or has made some movement in this space uh, recently and uh, this is going in the, in the right way um, I think this is this is pretty much about what I wanted to say to you today um, um, I, I just want to repeat myself somehow saying that the key challenge is obviously discoverability of information when you have when you have information spread across uh, one single platform obviously you cannot discover alternative point of view alternative views uh, that may uh, challenge your perspective so um, again for us the issue and the challenge is to multiply the sources of information that uh, have that have the benefit of providing users with different perspectives on the information sources they can experience thank you Thank you very much because that gives us a very different perspective on, on business uh, that shows that there is no fatality uh, in uh, um, data and uh, in data privacy and that we can have alternative views, um, especially coming from the self-regulatory field um, of the pure players. Um. But there is also the option of co-regulation of uh, intergovernmental uh, agencies um, and institutions that can bring several partners together. So that's why I'd like to hear what Emanuela Jovi has to say about um, this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to give me a pot opportunity to join uh, this panel. Uh, fake news are not a scoop. <laughs> you know the risk for democracy. 
there is for society, there is for uh, economy. Most of the policies that have been brought forward seem to be poorly adapted to the very nature of the cyber space, which is global and in affected by national territories. National law are often ineffective in dealing with this phenomenon. Some suggest giving cultural authority back to trustees, trusted institutions, media and university, and so, so on. In my perspective, this information will continue, will continue as long as some people benefit from manipulation or light. I would like to focus my presentation on two categories of solution or suggestion. First, firstly, media and social network education. It is important to re-educate the eye. Educational work with the population to help them to hone the judgment. This is important. It is also important to introduce in the school systems education for understanding the global information ecosystem in cyberspace, its authors, its challenges, and how it, it works. We have to teach children to be critical of digital production. It is important, it is important in my perspective to teach children to select and separate content production on the internet. The second thing is about citizen co-regulation involving citizen, citizen factor funding. As in Italy, it is possible to set up websites to allow citizens to report fake, fake news potentially encountered on the internet. But uh, the second stage, the second step, it is important to give the possibility to the media or to the police to, to check the fakes. At post through is also an emotional issue. It is important to teach authors in trusted institutions or citizens in charge of helping to re-establish re fat, to communicate fat or data in a way that highlight that the emotional, sentimental, and rational impact. The, the way to communicate, it is important. Thank you. Thank you very much for this um, plea for uh, co-regulation and for um, uh, critical thinking uh, for citizens. Uh, I think the Council of Europe has also a series of solutions. So could you tell us about it, Murad, please? Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about and briefly about our recent project on digital citizenship education. Actually, there are two, two ways to tackle uh, how to manage or how to you know, uh, battle with uh, information and or this uh, information disorders. One is preventation and the other one is fighting or protecting people from the uh, bad circumstances, negative circumstances from disinformation. So uh, if you attended other discussions or followed the previous IGFs or you follow Council of Europe's work in internet governance field, uh, you already know that we have been doing a lot uh, in uh, combating fake news, information disorders, etc., or contributing to the governance, good governance of internet. But I would like to brief you on the other side of the uh, picture, that there's also prevention, which means that 
you cut the fake news at the source or the information disorders. Uh, what I mean is you educate young generations uh, how to tackle, how to deal with information. I mean, it's not just information disorders. Dealing with information itself is a big challenge because there are lots of information. Yes, it, there has been, uh, you know, fake news in the history of humankind, but the uh, vast amount of information is, is really, uh, it's the first time in, uh, in the recent years. So, uh, Council of Europe's action against uh, action regard to internet uh, is mostly protecting children so far, but in 2016, uh, the Steering Committee for Education Policy and Practice launched a new project, intergovernmental project on digital citizenship education to uh, respond to the uh, challenges that internet and digital technologies bring. So I just give you a, a few information about the concept of digital citizenship education that we are proposing uh, to our citizens in Europe. And what we mean by digital citizenship is to empower the learners, in particular the children, young learners, with necessary competencies and to empower them to be able to engage positively, critically, and competently in the digital environment and to practice forms of social participation that are respectful of human rights and dignity through the responsible use of technology. This project builds on the Council of Europe's long-standing uh, program on education for democratic citizenship, which has been promoting active and responsible citizenship throughout European countries or Council of Europe member states. So a digital citizen for us is the one who creates, shares, socializes, even works online, participates actively and responsibly in local, national, and global communities. For example, if I may, Change.org. It's a global you know, campaign that everybody can start something uh, globally. And uh, at political, economic, or social levels, and uh, the, the person seeks for continuous personal and professional development, which means lifelong learning in informal, formal, and non-formal settings. And most importantly, the digital citizen defends, protects, and promotes human rights. So uh, the digital citizenship education concept, the way we see it, builds uh, on the competencies for democratic culture. So. It doesn't mean that you're online, you're fully, you know, uh, disconnected from your real life or offline life. So what applies to your offline life applies to your online life. So we need to build the personalities, the, the people's capacities and competencies to deal with the challenges of life, not offline only, but also in the online environment. So there are 10 digital domains that our expert group came up with uh, that we would like to improve digital citizenship education. They are divided under three main clusters, being online, well-being online, and rights online. And those 10 digital domains will help us to uh, steer the development process of digital citizenship education. And uh, they are the underpinning Overall, uh, they, are, they are the underpinning um, concepts for digital citizenship education, and uh, how would I say? Uh, for example, media and information literacy is one of our digital citizenship domains. This is necessary to gather information, process information, and proceed with the information. What I mean is that. Yes, internet is a good opportunity to gather information, but it's up to you how to proceed, how to process it. You can manipulate the information and how you proceed with it. I mean, you can share it directly or you can check its uh, credibility and then endorse it, like on Twitter or Facebook. Uh, you can share something, but you have to make sure what you're sharing is, uh, you know, credible. And uh, 
but media and information literacy, it's important, it's not enough. So for example, you have to develop competencies like uh, ethics and empathy in the learners because before they share the information, they have to make sure that this information may affect many people's lives. So they have to think from the others, uh, others' uh, point of view. And uh, you are creating your e-presence and uh, digital footprint. So you have to make sure that what kind of reputation you will have. So, and then uh, lastly, privacy and security. And the, uh, there are two, those are two different concepts. Privacy concerns mainly the personal protection of one's own and others' online information, while security is related to one's own awareness of online actions and behavior. So it covers competencies such as information management and online safety issues, and to deal with and avoid dangerous and unpleasant, unpleasant situations. And as uh, the topic of this year's IGF is Internet of Trust. So if you want Internet of Trust, then you have to have trusted citizens which produce trusted information and content. So we are feeding, we are concerned about artificial intelligence, but we are feeding the artificial intelligence by sharing information, creating information, and then so then we face the consequences. And uh, the, the uh, as, uh, as you know, in, in Turkey, we say the best treatment is not to get sick. So if you can prevent this happening at the very early ages, starting from preschool, then I hope in the future we may have less problems regarding to information disorders. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this concludes our first round of discussions. I would like to have, we have an hour left, a little bit of time of exchange questions from the floor to our panelists before we really open the, the presentations of the floor and the, and the questions of the floor about themselves, about possible options. Yes, present yourself so that we know who you are. Bonjour tout le monde. Je viens d'Haïti. J'ai une question pour le panel. En ce qui concerne la cybersécurité, les fausses informations sur les réseaux sociaux, on constate qu'en Haïti, les, on n'a pas vraiment le contrôle et aucune entité ne gère pas ça. Alors, qu qu'est-ce qu que vous pouvez proposer pour, pour que nous, les jeunes qui, qui maintenant font l'éducation des gens et l'éducation sur les gens sur les réseaux sociaux. Qu'est-ce que vous pouvez proposer par où on peut commencer? Just to everybody on the panel, uh, the question from Haiti is about uh, cybersecurity and social uh, media. Um, it's hard to have control over them. It's hard to know which entity has control over them. And so what can we do about that? Uh, Emmanuel. I would love to response in French for four reasons. <laughs> je, je, je viens aussi d'Haïti, comme vous. <laughs> Et, mais je, je travaille pour l'OIF. Je suis le directeur du bureau régional de l'OIF dans les Caraïbes et l'Amérique latine. Donc, ce que je peux vous dire du fait que euh, il faut... Je, je vois votre volonté de lier la mise en place d'institutions sur la cybersécurité et les fausses informations, les fake news. Je pense que euh, ce n'est pas forcément une bonne approche parce qu'on peut avoir des institutions de cybersécurité et Dieu seul sait que beaucoup de pays occidentaux disposent d'institutions de cybersécurité avancées. Mais les fake news existent malgré ces institutions. Ce n'est pas, pas lié à l'existence d'institutions de, de cybersécurité. Je crois que ce qu'il est important de, de retenir dans cette démarche, euh, pour moi, c'est trois choses. La première chose, cela a été dit, la prévention. C'est-à-dire que dans 
aussi bien dans le pays qu'à l'extérieur, on doit travailler sur la prévention. Et la prévention nécessite euh, une euh, approche euh, multipartite, c'est-à-dire ne pas dire que c'est seulement le gouvernement qui va régler, c'est seulement euh, les opérateurs, comment les, les avoir des top, comment on peut les dire Les opérateurs, oui. Ou le secteur privé, <rire> parce qu'il faut switcher souvent, <rire> qui, qui doivent régler cela. Il y a aussi les acteurs de la société civile. Et ces acteurs de la société civile peuvent travailler et d'abord sur la question de l'éducation de façon générale. Cela a été évoqué, il faut renforcer la compétence des gens. Donc le travail que vous faites dans ce sens doit continuer en termes de renforcement des compétences, et, mais ça doit être affiné parce qu'il faut faire euh, l'éducation aux, euh, aux, aux médias et réseaux sociaux, comme on fait l'éducation pour les médias. Et, et de ce point de vue, on a besoin de compétences affinées pour faire cette éducation aux médias et répondre à, à votre problématique. Et en même temps qu'on on amène les acteurs publics à mettre en place euh, des structures qui puissent permettre aux citoyens de faire des signalements. Donc de dire, eh bien, euh, il y a une information, nous disposons d'autres éléments et autres. Ça pourrait permettre de, de, de répondre à, à ces pré pré préoccupations. Donc, c'est pas la cybersécurité est un aspect qui peut continuer, con, contribuer sur l'aspect de la circulation des rumeurs. Il y a des structures qui peuvent faire ça, mais ce n'est pas suffisant. Il faut aller plus loin, il faut avoir une vision plus large. Yes, um, Martin Schmalzried from uh, Kofase Families Europe. Um, on the topic of prevention, because I also wanted to, to address that topic, I haven't really heard anything about the socioeconomic factors behind fake news. I mean, as you know, for instance, I'm just taking the example of the United States. Uh, in the Rust Belt, there's um, a lot of people that are pro-Trump, for instance, and it's been clearly tied to their socioeconomic situation, loss of employment, poverty. Um, <clears throat> many of these people are ready to jump on any kind of easy explanation for the situation they're in. Um, and I'm wondering if you have a response to that, which is, if we continue into a world where people are poorer and poorer, inequalities are rising, I wouldn't be surprised that fake news would also rise. Um, and, you know, you can do whatever. You can filter, you can censor, you can educate. But the underlying causes is that people are kind of lost And, you know, between the top economists, which try to explain this in very complex concepts um, of why we got here to this point, even explaining the 2008 crisis, for instance, good luck. Um, and, um, you know, the people that are saying, well, you know, it's the migrants, it's this, it's that. Uh, which ones will people in that kind of situation uh, are likely to believe? Um, and so I wonder if you have anything uh, to say about that. I suppose I can tell this one is for you. Thanks for raising that. I think that's critically important, and I think we see this in country after country around the world, that a critical variable in terms of how severe problems of disinformation are, are um, the levels of discontent in the public and the degree to which political actors are seeking to speak to that discontent, sometimes in ways um, that um, are not premised in the idea that truth has any particular centrality in public discourse, if you will. Um, So I think there's no question that the backdrop of this is a profound crisis of confidence between much of the public and much of the political establishment and many establishment institutions in many societies around the world. And I think we can also see very clearly that in countries in which this crisis of confidence is far less pronounced, arguably we have seen far less severe problems of disinformation, even though the very same technologies are equally or even more widely used. I would point to the example of Sweden, for example, um, but also of Germany as another example. So it's clear that technology is integral to the way in which this information is spread, no question about it. It's also clear that the companies that profit from these technologies can do m a much better job of taking their responsibilities seriously. But fundamentally, many of the problems of disinformation are deeply social and political. The only thing I would add to what you said, which I think is important, um, is that um, In the country in which uh, I think the empirical research in this is most developed, the United States, 
Um, one thing that I think is, is sometimes overlooked in discussions like this is as important as discussions of media literacy are around young people, and I very much second the work of the Council of Europe and others in enhancing our work in media and information literacy for young people, in fact, the greatest consumers and disseminators of uh, disinformation online in the U.S. electoral context, most research suggests, were older men, um, often highly partisan. Uh, so I think we should be quite careful about sort of associating this problem with younger people, and I think as the uh, participants on the floor suggested, really recognize that much of this is fueled by deep, deep discontent with establishment institutions. Uh, hello, my name is Amy. Um, uh, my question is to, I think, a couple of the speakers that raised as one of the potential responses transparency measures on the part of uh, intermediaries or platforms. And there's a couple of transparency measures that I think um, are well understood and have been given as examples throughout the IGF. So the idea of transparency around paid content and who it's targeting and who paid for it and so forth. So that's, I think, one kind of transparency that could be, it could be sought. Another kind is the types of reports about the way that moderation is happening. So for example, how many complaints they got, how much of that content was taken down, how many times it was appealed, what the results of those appeals were. But beyond those two vectors of potential transparency, are there other areas of transparency that you think would be useful? And I sp I, I'm speaking especially, I think, to Rasmussen because he spoke a bit about how we need the inputs for the research in order to take the next steps in, in examining the problem. What other types of transparency would be useful? Thank you. I think it's a collective enterprise uh, to develop those, and I'm very glad that Paula and others are trying to push this discussion politically. And we were earlier at a panel on regulators. I think no one on their own has the answers to what we're looking for here. So I'm very glad that also this is very central discussions here at IGF, what we should be asking for. Um, what I would say, um, I think, at this stage is that from the point of view of the independent research community, um, it's clear that we are currently enable, uh, unable to really assess the scale and the scope of the problems that we face and the effectiveness of responses. Uh, I would say for um, two reasons uh, that, that, that uh, have to do um, with transparency. One is the access to data, um, primary data from the platforms themselves. The methods that we have that do not rely on primary source data are often don't have the granularity or the pace, then is rightly uh, highlighted the question of the pace of things to really address these things in real time. And only the companies themselves have access to that. Now, I realize, of course, there are very, very real concerns over data protection and privacy here. And I think if you went to Facebook these days and said you had to come from a famous medieval university uh, in the UK and added the word analytica uh, and suggested you would like to have access to data, they might sort of chase you away with armed guards or something. Uh, so I think there is a, a sort of a complication here that we need to recognize is a real complication. I think the other thing is not about transparency, but it's about funding. And I have to say, if uh, politicians in high-income democracies had been as serious as supporting research into disinformation as they have been about talking about it, I think we would know a lot more about where we are and how effective the responses that we've seen so far have been, and thus perhaps able to uh, protect our democracies better. Yeah, on, on this issue of transparency, uh, uh, I, I'm an activist of transparency on all uh, issues, so, so I think we, we can't be transparent enough, uh, even if we are a private company, it's the only way to uh, trust, and, and we are talking about internet of trust. So, uh, But there's an interesting uh, thing that was uh, proposed by, by Emmanuel Macron yesterday, uh, which was a pilot where regulators uh, can access uh, to all the information system of, of Facebook. And this is uh, the first time something like that is tried, and I think it's, it's very interesting. They're trying to uh, copy the model of, of the banking system, and uh, and I think when they see all the data that is uh, available, they will also understand which data can be released or which data can be asked by uh, citizens directly. So uh, it's the first time we open the, the black box. I mean. <laughs> And so, so this is, is going to be a very interesting experiment. Um, there's also a lot we can do with uh, existing data. 
that we can uh, scrap on the, the websites or uh, that we can access through APIs. Most of social media have APIs. Uh, for instance, uh, there's a, an interesting report that was done by, by the Knight Foundation uh, uh, where they try to understand uh, which uh, fake news are um, deployed automatically through bots and uh, you can really uh, understand how um, uh, some kind of, of profiles of accounts uh, are uh, very easily to identify as bots because uh, they tweet, for instance, on a regular basis uh, or uh, they use uh, uh, some kind of vocabulary uh, or they have a way of, of acting as accounts that uh, makes that they, they must be bots. And so you have, for instance, a, a website that is very interesting uh, that was developed in Brazil that's called Pegabot, uh, where you put your, your account or any account, Twitter account, and it automatically, automatically tells you uh, what is the probability that this account is a bot or, or an automatically or a fake account. Um, so this kind of, of information can already be done with the information that is available uh, at the moment. Yeah, um, uh, just I would like to pile on, on what has just been said. Um, this is fundamentally transparency poses the problem of neutrality versus editorialization versus censorship. Um, and, and you know, if you look at you know uh, the problem from those three angles, then you basically ask yourself, you know, to what level should we combine information delivery together with the algorithms that have made this delivery possible? So in other words, when Paola was t talking about these bots um, and discoverability of those bots, I wonder, you know, if Facebook was about to implement this bot to censor the content that those bots have been producing, then in which case you will start answering, asking yourself, what neutrality is here? You know, how can I trust in what Facebook delivers here or Facebook or some other social media platform or search engine, it doesn't matter. Um, so the one question that we may ask ourselves is, should we deliver information in the same way that uh, we deliver press information in newspapers where when you buy a newspaper, you know it's bias, which basically, basically is the brand of the, of, the, of the newspaper or the editorialization uh, bias. Uh, when we deliver information on the web, then should we also make it available together with the algorithms that have led this information to become accessible and in consequence accompany the information delivery with in, in enough metadata, excuse the, uh, the uh, lingo here, um, that allows users to understand to what extent this information can be trusted and what has led to this information selection. So, a last question from uh, the room, sir. Merci, bonjour tout le monde. Et je suis Dali Amadi Diallo, et du Mali. Cette thématique euh, au sujet des fake news, comme l'a dit Monsieur Ayovi, ça affecte la sécurité des gens, ça affecte la société, ça affecte et tout. Donc, c'est un problème global qui est là et qui, est, qui expose tout le monde à, à toutes sortes de, de dangers. Bon, lorsqu'on se réfère à l'actualité dernièrement, je, je prendrai l'exemple de mon pays, par exemple, à chaque fois qu'il y a des élections, les réseaux sociaux, Facebook, euh, à, à WhatsApp sont bloqués. Mais les, mais les gens trouvent toujours des portes dérobées pour entrer et en utilisant VPN. Bien. Donc, C est, c est, ça a été la solution alternative pour, pour bloquer un peu les fake news, notamment et les fausses informations et, et la, la promulgation de, de faux résultats. Certes, les autorités se sont intéressées à cette question, mais cette question fait beaucoup de mal en Afrique. Il y a beaucoup d'Africains ici, et heureusement. Nous, lorsqu'il s'agit d'investir dans le domaine de l'éducation, d'abord l'éducation formelle, la prise en charge de cette éducation formelle, elle n'est déjà pas un acquis. Le taux de pénétration d'Internet avec euh, les smartphones, c'est en train de grimper. Donc, ces fake news aussi sont en train de grimper. Donc, 
pour des populations qui n'ont pas encore accès à l'éducation formelle, lorsqu'on commence à parler de situation d'éducation à la citoyenneté numérique, qui est citoyen D'abord, combien de personnes, combien de personnes ne sont pas enregistrées Le premier droit de l'être humain, c'est d'abord d'être enregistré. Là, on a parlé maintenant de l'identification des, des cartes SIM. Ceci n'est pas encore un acquis. Donc, ce qui veut dire que dans nos pays, n'importe qui peut se procurer une carte SIM et propager ça. Donc, même s'il y a des lois, est-ce qu'elles seront efficaces chez nous Premier problème. Et au-delà de l'aspect politique, je pense que là, il va y avoir euh, des solutions à, à, à vitesse multiple. On a parlé de la France qui est en train d'élaborer ou qui a déjà sa nouvelle euh, loi. Le Conseil de, de l'Europe euh, il parle euh, de la capacité de l'éducation à la citoyenneté et numérique. Mais cette éducation à la citoyenneté numérique, comment est-ce que l'Afrique pourra prendre ça en charge Lorsqu'on prend et, euh, un pays comme la France, la France peut avoir une, une position. Les États-Unis, le Brésil, l'Inde, euh, la Chine. Mais nous, nos pays, ils interviennent en groupe. Euh, pour quelqu'un ici, quelqu'un peut one shop euh, et desk. Mais, lors euh, du dernier sommet ouest africain en matière de gouvernance d'Internet, cette problématique n'a pas été prise en compte. Mais, imaginez maintenant combien de personnes peuvent se dire quand qu'un qu qu un gombo, euh, la tête et la queue coupée, trempée dans de l'eau, se soignerait le diabète. Pourtant, ça, ça circule sur Facebook. Et il y a beaucoup de gens qui ont abandonné leur traitement pour des informations comme ça. Donc, qu'est-ce qui se passe On se dit qu'on investit dans, pour les besoins sociaux de base, on laisse le numérique à la périphérie, mais c'est cette périphérie qui vient détruire ce que nous sommes en train de, de nous battre. Donc, euh, je pense que ce problème posé, et si les uns et les autres peuvent nous proposer des solutions, ben, on apporterait ça volontiers avec nous. Et sinon, c'est vraiment le moment qu'on se dise, bien, par rapport à cette éducation à la citoyenneté numérique, qui va proposer des modules de formation qui vont avoir une portée transversale, que nos dirigeants aient au moins un cadre de référence. Donc, que la société civile, le secteur privé, les gouvernants, donc, mais il faut, moi je pense qu'il faut vraiment dans nos pays des programmes d'appui à la gouvernance d'Internet ou des programmes d'appui au numérique. On a créé des ministères de l'économie numérique dans nos pays, mais souvent, force est de reconnaître que ben, euh, ce, ce, ces ministères sont, sont là. Ça répond à un besoin réel. Mais est-ce qu'ils sont fonctionnels est-ce qu'ils sont capables de, de parvenir à, à un certain résultat Donc, je pense qu'à partir d'un certain moment, eh c'est Internet est global. Quelle est la solution globale que les Nations Unies peuvent nous proposer Top. Pour ne pas être je vous long, arrête je vais m'arrêter là. Je vous censure, oui, juste au dernier moment. Mais euh, merci d'exprimer de, la, la position de l'Afrique. Moi, je ne pense pas que l'Afrique ait à avoir de sentiment d'infériorité. Mais je ne vais pas parler pour vous. Euh, je pense qu'on est tous... Euh, vraiment très égaux face à la fake news, euh, mais j'en dirai pas plus. Emmanuel, peut-être que tu peux apporter Merci. un début de réponse. Non, ce que je, je voudrais lui dire, euh, Monsieur Dali, c'est que on n'a pas besoin de programme d'appui pour faire face à, à ça. Avant Internet, il y avait l'éducation communautaire en Afrique. Effectivement. Pourquoi ne pas faire preuve d'imagination et utiliser l'éducation communautaire pour sensibiliser les gens. Donc, je crois qu'il faut penser aux solutions locales pour répondre à, à ces préoccupations. Il n'y aura jamais de solution mondiale. Comme je le disais, tant que des gens vont tirer profit de, de, de la désinformation, des fausses nouvelles, des fake news, ça va toujours exister. Et ça va s'aggraver encore avec les, les types fake qui sont en préparation, qui ont commencé d'ailleurs. Ça va s'aggraver encore. De ce point de vue, la solution, ce n'est évidemment pas de couper Internet. 
Ce n'est pas de couper les réseaux sociaux. La solution, c'est d'éduquer les gens. Et il faut, il faut reprendre le pouvoir sur l'éducation. Et reprendre le pouvoir sur l'éducation, cela veut dire que ne pas se fier simplement à l'éducation formelle. L'éducation tout au long de la vie, ça signifie quelque chose. Et ça a existé dans les sociétés africaines avant le contact avec le monde extérieur. Donc je crois que le retour aux solutions africaines constitue pour moi la bonne voie dans bien des domaines. Pas simplement ça, dans, dans plusieurs domaines. La, la preuve, vous le voyez, au niveau de l'environnement. Tout le monde parle de l'environnement. Mm -hmm. Mais quand vous, vous regardez les solutions qui sont préconisées, tout ce qui se dit et autres, quand vous connaissez l'Afrique profonde et comment cela se passe, comme je le disais à propos de fake news, ce n'est pas un scoop pour les Africains. Non, pas du tout. Voilà. Pas du tout. Merci. I think some of the ideas could be also cooperation, exchange of practices, etc. And this is what I would like to hear from the floor now. Uh, some of you have practices, have uh, applications. I see uh, some people I know, so don't ask me to name you, but go ahead. Uh, people from digital parenting, people from Stories Eye, etc. Can you please uh, present to us um, what you've come up as solutions? Present yourself, please. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Claudio Pokoroki. I'm with the uh, World Economic Forum. And today I'm here representing some of the work that we're doing in uh, digital intelligence capacity building. So um, in October 2016, as part of one of our workshops, uh, um, an NGO partnership called the DQ Institute was launched. Can you speak away from the mic? Because Sorry. we hear the splutter more than the Is ideas, that and that's a real problem. Is that better? Is that better? No? OK. Um, is that OK? Everybody can hear me? Excellent. Um, OK, is that OK? All right. October 2016, the DQ Institute was launched at a Singapore. Uh, and through the World Economic Forum and our partnership, um, this institute's been able to essentially um, expand its program in 30 countries around the world. Um, it took uh, just over a year, and we're active in 30 countries in the, around the world in 15 different languages. And what the DQ Institute has is a, uh, first of all, is a, is a digital intelligence framework, which is a definition of um, eight different competency levels that uh, es ex essentially explain and uh, provide um, capacity building around digital citizen citizenship skills, including a content delivery platform, a curriculum delivery platform, and measurement platform. Um, this is a very scalable solution, and we've been able to, as I said, launch in 30 different countries, including two in Africa, so one in Nigeria uh, and one in South Africa. We have two pilots active. Um, and out of this DQ Institute, through the forum, we have been able to evangelize this framework. Uh, and it has actually been, uh, we've created a, a coalition for digital intelligence, which involves the OECD and IEEE. So it involves both on the education side, so the public side, and the private sector side. And through IEEE, we are creating actually a global standard around the DQ framework. And through the OECD, Um, their uh, 2030 future education model. It has been adopted by the OEDC and OECD and officially uh, endorsed. So we are expanding uh, and we're looking for obviously uh, any, any countries or partnerships that are willing to look into the DQ framework, adopt it and help um, essentially uh, help us build out uh, this solution moving forward. It's focused on eight to 12 year olds uh, but we're also expanding into other demographics because as rightly said, um, let's say that digital citizenship isn't just for the youth, it's uh, for many different demographies. So if anyone is interested, they can come and see me afterwards um, or look up uh, dqinstitute.org or even more simply coalition for digital intelligence.org. Okay, Thank you. That's uh, anybody else? Uh, yes, uh, and then um, you back there. Yeah, I, I think there have been an enormous lot of initiatives, but I see one fundamental problem. I've worked in half a dozen countries in Africa, in Australia, 
all over the world. And basically, you know, how many of us here are actually educators who are going to take these ideas and put them in the classroom? Because this has always been the problem. The people who talk about these issues aren't the teachers. And the teachers who would like to do something about it are not getting teacher training that's going to help them actually do something about information disorders and others. There seems to be a real gap. I've been saying for years that how can you have an IGF without having those people who are educating the children? And how can you have people who are not trained psychologists and teachers going into school and teaching about these things? There's a real gap. There is a need for this multidisciplinarity. And I'm afraid after 50 years as a teacher and the last 25 years trying to do something in this field, we're not going to make it until we start bringing the educational staff in here give them an equal voice and don't try and tell them what to do about information disorders. They're part of the issue, so they should be part of this discussion. Just a question, how many teachers are there in this room or how many people in this room who train teachers to actually do something about these issues? They're short but most of us are university teachers who aren't teacher trainers. Thank you. We're trying to cheat, Janice, but you saw through us. I think Quant has something to answer there. Yeah, th thank you for bringing this uh, capital issue, actually. Um, so Quant, we have been very sensitive to this problem uh, back in the days, you know, the unfortunate um, Bataclan um, terrorist attacks, you know, back in Paris, 2015. Um, where we actually considered, you know, what was happening the day after the terrorist attack and um, looked at what Google was offering when you would type Bataclan. And um, unfortunately, what you only saw was just, you know, horrendously horrible pictures of dead bodies on the floor. Uh, but conversely, if you typed anything related to nudity at that very time, you would have seen anything perfectly clean and filtered. So the question is about culture. The question is about education of young people uh, yeah, students in particular about making the distinction of uh, the cultural bias they may be exposed to. And to that extent, we've created a search engine that is entirely dedicated to children. Uh, we call it Quant Junior. And uh, the, I think, you know, to answer your question, um, we, what we take pride of with this product is actually to make a very sensitive judgment about censorship, um, editorialization, and neutrality. Um, together with the French government, we have decided that we should be able to, uh, we should allow ourselves to editorialize, even censor some content based on some, some um, very um, well-identified list of topics, which is basically pornography, violence, drugs, and, and hatred in, in general. Um, based on that, we're able to give teachers a tool in which they feel confident to educate children to go and search on the internet, discover the entire diversity of content there available, uh, and yet be confident that nothing uh, inappropriate will show up. And then we have teachers starting to develop um, uh, pedagogical sequences where they put together a search on Google with a with a uh, logged in account, search on Google without a, an account, and search on Quant and on Quant Junior. And then having children express differences, see the difference, and re reflect on what they see. So this is one of the um, initiatives that, that we are taking. We are one of the many, of course, but being a search engine, we are very central to information access, and I think you should start from there. Sir, present yourself, introduce yourself. My name is Vitaly Moroz. I am from Ukraine. Um, uh, Ukraine uh, is in fifth year of uh, facing in information warfare, and we have a lot of experience in it. And I would definitely tell you that media literacy is very important, but it's not sufficient. Um, there are many initiatives to educate and to prevent, uh, but it should be probably discussion on the higher level, on the level of policy. Uh, and um, we unite um, uh, opinion leaders and think tanks uh, to find approaches, uh, comprehensive approaches, how to combat uh, misinformation. And today what I hear, we talk a lot about um, uh, the targets of misinformation campaigns, audiences, users, and we talk uh, a lot about intermediaries uh, like Google and tech companies. 
but we haven't talked about uh, those who initiate uh, the campaigns. And for sure, with respect to uh, uh, freedom of, uh, of information and media freedoms, we still should talk about uh, some media outlets which may be the agents of foreign influences. There are some media which uh, uh, launch inf in information attacks and we should talk about politicians who order uh, these uh, uh, campaigns as, as we heard from Brazil. Um, and uh, on the level of policy, uh, there should be the strategy how to combat misinformation as a, and there can be uh, two approaches. One is follow the money. Uh, what sources were used to launch information uh, uh, campaigns against uh, countries or uh, citizens. And second, uh, we should start talking about um, the approach which is called naming and shaming. Uh, because within the actors, there are definitely um, quality journalism, uh, but there may be uh, like the websites which nobody knows who registered where they register because you can easily hide identity of any ownership of uh, any websites and it can be run from foreign countries uh, and this is uh, could be like the approaches uh, to uh, to provide responses not just in media literacy but on the policy level and this uh, first of all this is the issue uh, for national governments with respect to freedom of information and media freedoms uh, in general thank you Thank you. The last uh, presentation, because we have to close. Thank you. Um, I'm Francois Mozilla Paris. I'm very amazed by some of the, there is a need in Europe. I think we have a need in Europe for, uh, let's say it's like you have anxiety, you need a magical pill, an immediate and easy solution. So why in Europe, uh, with uh, facing a problem like uh, fake news, we ask, we are begging, we are craving for an easy solution. Let me explain my points. Uh, so most of us here are thinking about a technical answer for a human problem. A technical answer should be for robots or bots. Uh, but uh, so far we, we are not, we made of flesh and bones. We are, we, we have emotion. The, I think why we have uh, fake news now is uh, somehow easily explainable i mean if you remember in 2003 uh, in the main uh, the mainstream media uh, most of the media was explaining uh, french people and people in europe that uh, it would be the best to invade a country called iraq you know the rest of the story so uh, as we're made of flesh and bones of course people will go crazy there will be an insane environment it makes sense uh, I don't think we need a technical answer. I'd like to underline uh, what you just previously said, sir, about the culture in Africa, uh, the culture, the um, importance of culture and togetherness. That's what we, I think that's what we, we lost it in, that's the main point, uh, facing fake news, togetherness. We lost togetherness because in a sane country, people will exchange. If I have a Lebanese, a Lebanese or a Syrian uh, neighbor, I, don't, I wouldn't mind about you know, uh, the origin. I would exchange with my neighbor. I would share, not everything, but I would have a discussion. And then I would learn a different point of view. So that's why we lost, I think, in Europe, togetherness. People, uh, some of us, they don't want to live into uh, um, a d diversity, diversity, a mixed culture, you know. We've lost it. Uh, and I think it's it's a very sad uh, it's it's a very sad point. And uh, the last the last question uh, wants me to wants to underline the it makes me underline the fact that togetherness is not only the answer for fake news and also education. And uh, the lack of togetherness is also uh, a security matter for foreign interference with all the misunderstanding, with the chaos. Uh, togetherness is a great weakness in a European society. I think to me, it's normally it's, you, have to be, you have to have critical mind if you go to school or unless our educational system is not relevant at all. Are we going technical just like robots? Thank you. Okay, I don't want to stay on a negative note. 
So I would say we've seen plenty of togetherness today at the table and around uh, the floor. And I think that together, uh, united, uh, we certainly can fight and hopefully win this, uh, this war on trust and this war on truth uh, for a culture of peace. So thank you all for your presentations and for your participation and see you uh, online with a final report about this session. Thank you everyone on behalf of Italian Society France and we'll continue to work uh, on the issue and to try to foster against fake news and hate speech. Thank you all.